it's Haley on Hot Radio Maine on the line with comedian Matt Bronger. Now, Matt, you are going to be performing live at Cisco Brewers in Portsmouth this weekend as a part of your There He Is Folks tour. I got to ask, how has the tour been going thus far? Uh, it, it's been gangbusters, especially yes. since I, I, I kind of did this thing in the last uh, year where I scaled back my tour schedule to be with my three-year-old more. Oh. And, uh, well, uh, and also to not have my wife kill me sure. to watch the three-year-old by herself every weekend. Fair um, enough. It's both those, both those things. But yeah, and, and it, so it's kind of like every show, since I'm not gone every weekend or even every other weekend, it's kind of like extra special to be out about and doing these kind of select shows. So yeah, we had a, a great run in Atlanta a couple weeks ago, um, and we have Seattle after Portsmouth, but it's just, it's cool to come back to this cool little town that I've been to. This will be, I want to say my third or fourth time playing Portsmouth. So it's like, it's, 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 it's rad that there's such a, a market, such a, you know, a, a good comedy, you know, fan base for any kind of shows that come out, which is awesome. Totally. Portsmouth is such a cute little town and they definitely love events like this. They're going to be so excited to have you there this weekend. What do you enjoy the most about performing live on tour, Matt? These days, it's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, barfing out whatever weird thoughts or feelings I've had, you know, <laughs> during the week and kind of integrate them into kind of, you know, if anyone's ever seen me, they know I kind of do a lot of stories. I do a lot of, um, you know, uh, 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 observations based on my own life. Yeah. I don't do a ton of kind of current events. Lately, I've done a little bit more of that because I feel like we as a as a, I would say as a nation and also as a human race kind of feel detached from each other a lot. So it's kind of It's kind of fun to kind of talk about the things that are making us anxious and the things that are making us, you know, spin out and kind of make everyone go, all right, well, let's just all calm down a second. We're all in this together. We're, we're, we're all going through it. It's not just you. You know, I've, I've found that, that um, you know, me just talking about my kids sleep regressing and kind of comparing that to the political landscape mm-hmm. right now in terms of the anxiety it's causing, that alone has made me connect with audiences in a huge way. So, you know, it's, it, it, it's about the connection. It really is. I, you know, not to go on and on, but literally last thing I'll, I'll say is like, you know, right now we're spinning out about about AI and stuff, but the one thing that, uh, you know, technology and computers, I, to my mind, will never recreate is the connection between a live performer and a live audience. Like, I remember everything I've ever seen live. I can't tell you anything I streamed last night. Yes. So, you know, <laughs> the live experience is in unduplicatable, if that's a word. Yeah, you know? I think it so, is. <laughs> No, I agree 100%. <laughs> Having that in-person connection is so different. We doom scroll all day too, and I couldn't tell you any oh. skit I've seen on Instagram, but I'll always remember our conversation, Matt, for sure. <laughs> 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 now, you were raised in the other Portland in Oregon. Our station is in Portland, Maine, and I hear Portland, oh, yeah. Oregon is quite similar to our own, just a little bit bigger. So I'm curious, what was growing up in Portland like for you? It was fantastic. It was, you know, uh, just felt like a small town. I mean, to me, it is a small town still. It just, it's gotten a lot of national attention and a lot of people have found that that's the place where they want to kind of move to and settle down being being weird or whatever they want to do. I, I think the, the, the correlation, not just because of the names, but I just feel like anywhere you have a city right on the edge, yes. you know, of the continent and uh, uh, kind of like doing its own thing, like a really extreme version would be probably uh, uh, Provincetown, yes. you know, uh, mm-hmm. which is, you know, super weird and super like, uh, you know, artsy, but still like a little old town. Uh, it's, it's a little bit like that with, I feel like, both Portland. I really, when I when I came to Portland, Maine, I was like, oh yeah, this is this is another Portland I could, without a doubt, live yes. in. It's oh. the livability factor that everybody's seeming to get along and, um, you know, just uh, being... Being different is okay, I guess, would be in a nutshell. There's something about being on the edge I think we can both relate to. So (laughs) there's definitely that. (laughs) Absolutely. Now, I got to ask, Matt, what inspired you to pursue a career in comedy? Because it doesn't seem like it's for the week. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's something. I mean, when I've had, when I was on a, I was on uh, The Tonight Show, and I remember Dr. Sanjay Gupta being like, wow, that's so hard. I'm like, aren't you like a brain surgeon? What do you mean hard? <laughs> um, but 
you know, it's just, it's one of those things when I, I grew up an only child and I was always in the school play and it, it comes down to kind of, you start with going, wow, as George Carlin put, put it, it's all about dig me, you know, hey, here I am, attention, attention. Mm-hmm. But then you kind of get into the, the, the different levels of art forms of, of, you know, from, you know, doing acting to doing improvising. And then when I was in Chicago, uh, because I, I just, I had a hard time breaking into the, the quote unquote real theater. Um, cause there's a lot of, of theaters in Chicago, but you know, they take it very seriously. So me just kind of showing up and being like, well, how about this? And they're like, well, we don't know you. And that's not, you know, the, it, it, I, to be, to be frank, I was probably 22 and kind of had that level of entitlement. Mm-hmm. Of like, yeah, but what, how do I not work hard at this? Is there a way that I can get where you're at without working hard? You know, and of course that's bonkers. And, you know, so I, I fell to doing improv. And that was the thing that clicked. And I was like, oh, wow, you make it up on the spot. But if you, you know, be too selfish on stage, you you ruin everything and you make it bad for your your uh, your, your troop mate. And I was like, oh, okay. And that really helped me with teamwork. And then I started doing uh, open mic doing stand-up and I fell in with these other people who were all doing wildly different things. You know, we had an open mic uh, in Chicago called the Lion's Den that uh, everybody kind of came out of. You know, I started out with um, Kyle Kinane and Pete Holmes and Camille Nanjiani and uh, TJ Miller and Hannibal Burris and um, John Roy and all these other people that are now basically household names. And it's all because we had that open mic. We were always trying to say something different than each other. Whereas I feel like a lot of stand-up scenes, because there was a lot of competition and there was, uh, uh, you know, people were were, were uh, paying attention, I guess, for want of another term, to those scenes. They were going for the brass ring. We were just trying to get better. We didn't really see it. It wasn't until I'd done it maybe three, four years in Chicago till I went, oh, maybe I could move to New York. Maybe I could move to L.A. and see if I can do this as a career. And I eventually did after about six years. I moved to L.A. and, you know, it took a couple of years after that to make a living at it. But without the Chicago time, I wouldn't have had it. So for me, it was just an organic process. I, I was never that. When I was a kid, I was like, wow, it'd be cool to be a stand-up. But I was never like, let me work on being a stand-up. I was always right. just working on being an actor and just getting stage time and trying to get into plays and, you know, that kind of thing. So I, I didn't, it, I just kind of by, by uh, my environment, I should say, kind of fell into stand-up and stand-up clicked. And ironically, stand-up is the thing that has gotten me more acting work than auditioning. That's so awesome. It's important to know, like you said, how many years of work you put into that. None of this happened overnight, but all of that work definitely paid off. You were actually a cast member on the iconic Mad TV during its final season. What would you say is the biggest thing you learned from that experience? Just that, I mean, when you're starting out and you're, you're joking around with your friends and you think you're wasting time, you're not. Is because I remember on in, in Mad on Mad TV we would just be riffing and then a producer would walk by and be like that's a great idea for a sketch why don't you guys go write that and we'd go write it and it would get on TV oh wow and so it, it, it's one of those things where your interaction with other people who you find funny and they find you funny those you know it's it, it's, it's all about collaboration but also I will say because Mad TV by that time was such a machine and most of the fuel it ran on unfortunately was just kind of pop culture reference stuff we would have these giant um, script readings with everybody's sketches and the, the sketches that were the funniest typically wouldn't get in but the sketches that were like Britney Spears lost her kid or something like that mm-hmm. it was just like ah I mean okay it's ripped from the headlines ish and it kind of mean for this person sure. who none of us know you know right. <laughs> <laughs> I was glad I never really had to do stuff like that. I mean, my pop, pop culture stuff that they'd have me do would be like, you know, CSI Mayberry, yeah. where I was Andy Griffith. And there were all these horrible murders going on in Mayberry. And, you know, uh, Eric Price was Don Knotts, and he's just flipping out because Otis the Drunk just was found stabbed to death in his cell. You know, just like dark, but like we're, this is, we're taking, you know, Americana and turning it on its head and, and it's. And it, to me, it was like, okay, that's that's a nice bridge between the pop culture thing and the funny thing. But overall, it was one of those things that was like an amazing time, definitely one of the heights of my career. And over way too soon, you know, yes. it only got half a half a season that season because Fox just decided it wasn't making enough money at that point, and they just pulled the plug. So 
But I mean, it, it, I'm glad. I'm grateful for it uh, having happened. It was it was a lot of fun. Oh, that's amazing! And I personally will never forgive Fox for that. Um, I thought Mad TV was <laughs> such a special era, and that's so cool that you got to be a part of it, nonetheless, Matt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. Now, I have this running joke with people in my life that I'm going to pursue stand-up comedy someday, except the truth is it's not a joke and I low-key want to try it. So now that I have you here, Matt, I need to know what advice would you give to someone else interested in trying stand-up? Honestly, just find an open mic and just get ready to fail. Yeah. uh, Honestly, because the thing is, if you go up at an open mic and you have a joke that people like, it's like he's in front of a baby. Everyone's like, oh, thank God. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. No one looks at someone on stage, crosses their arms, and goes, man, I hope this person is awful. I hope they fail. Everybody's rooting for you when you're on a stage in front of them. So, you know, if, if you don't get in your head too much, and you're going to, listen, you're going to second guess yourself at, like, point oh 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 five seconds. You're going you're gonna to do it every millisecond in your head. Go, wait, was that right? Was this bad? Should I tell them how I'm feeling? Should I go off on a tangent? Don't. Just come up with a story or an observation you want to tell. You know, a couple in a row. Go up there with like a little notepad and have a couple things, little ideas sketched out. And get up there and just kind of pontificate. And honestly, it'll probably go better than you think it will. And then if you get the bug, you kind of just keep doing that. Keep doing open mic. Eventually, someone could be like, oh, will you open for me? Or, hey, I have this show, this book show I have in a bar. Do you want to come do 10 minutes? And then it's like you've got this little fun thing. I know a lot of people who do stand up but don't do it for a living. I know a lot of people who do that. It's one of those great things where where you're not, look, you're not asking me how you get into the the Royal Ballet Company of London. You know, you're not, you're not going, how do I become a successful team model? These are just Tom Foolery. This is just jo- everyone tells jokes here and there. And honestly, it can be one of the most cathartic things ever. You know, if someone, you know, can just get up there and, and let their whatever their expression out is. You know, that's why coffee shops and weird little bars that have open mics are kind of like these little angel centers, in a sense, yes. for people to kind of let that out. Because we tend to think, oh, if you're not making a living at it, then what's the point? And it's mm-hmm. like, well, that's insane. What about being happy? What about letting yourself kind of kind of bloom in front of others for one of another term? Oh, that is all such great advice, Matt. And I think one of the aspects of stand up that scares me the most is the idea of hecklers. Do you have any oh. memorable heckler experiences that stick out? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, it, 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 I always say, uh, ironically, heckling heckling happens not even more now, but there's a lot of crowd work videos mm. that comics put out these days when they're talking to the audience. So some audiences are like, hey, talk to us. And sometimes you're like, I don't want to talk to you. Yeah. I have all this stuff to get. And I will. I'll, I'll definitely interact. But you did mention at the beginning of this, we can cut stuff out. So I will tell this quick thing. Uh, I don't know if this word's going to get in or not. But I uh, was riffing on this subject. And this woman, out of nowhere, I think she was very drunk, just goes, wait, it's still a thing? <laughs> and because everyone in the audience heard her. I had to address it. I had to go, all right, where is this coming from? And what in the world did I say to make you think of that word? And so we just started discussing it, she and I. And so, it, it, but it was one of those things where it's like, look, I'm not going to act like no one said. You, you, so you can't ignore, right? you know, what, once, the, once the cat's out of the bag, it's out of the bag. You can't act like there isn't a cat running around the room now. There are times you have to address it. Typically, though, in in terms of what you're afraid of, it doesn't exist. There aren't that many people that are that much of jerks to like yell out, you suck or whatever. You know, you'll hear them talk to each other if they don't like you sometimes. And if you feel like people can hear them talking, sure, call it out. But in terms of what you're afraid of, nah, it doesn't really happen. Not much. That is great to hear. And it really warms my heart to to hear you say that almost everyone in the audience is rooting for you and wants you to do well. I think that information alone is very helpful. Yeah, because they're they're rooting for their own good time. Right. You know, no no one has a fun time watching a comedian bomb. It's horrible. Yeah, it's awkward for everyone involved. (laughs) Everybody feels terrible. Them, the audience. The bartender. Yeah, totally. No, in addition to comedy, Matt, you've also done quite a bit of acting and voice acting. You've been in Upload, Fuller House, a personal favorite of mine, Bojack Horseman, just to name a few. So out of all yeah. of those projects, which was your favorite to be a part of? Wow. 
if I had to pick a favorite, I would say probably a tie between Up All Night with Christina Applegate, where I was a wacky neighbor with uh, Jean Villapique. She played my crazy wife. Oh, my gosh. And uh, because that was just fun. Being, cause we were only supposed to be one episode. They just kept writing us in because we were just like, I, I call it like the, the Flanders on the Simpsons, but yes. a holes. <laughs> we're such jerks. Which I think is like, that's more true of, of a lot of the very like religious, religious people that I've known. They, they're incredibly judgmental. God bless Ned Flanders. Yes. But most people that are like that are like, well, you're going to hell. So why should I talk to you? Anyway, but like, it was really fun playing that, but also a tie between that and Agent Carter, where I was like this nerd scientist on this uh, this team in the 40s, right after the uh, World War II had ended. And you have superheroes and superpowers kind of coming on the scene and us kind of just scrambling and being this kind of, you know, gang of misfits. We had a woman uh, as a leader and a guy who was basically, for want of another term, a cripple, yeah. had a bum leg, which in those days you would be looked at as a pariah. There was a black guy on the team. There was me, who was this kind of insanely antisocial nerd. And it was just these people who, you know, bottom line, you wouldn't invite to like a very fancy dinner party in the 40s. Sure. But we were out there kind of like the front line against this new danger. And so it's like, I, I didn't get to do, and I haven't gotten to do a lot of drama and a lot of serious stuff. And it was also like a funny show in a lot of places. But it was just fun to, uh, it was really fun to play in that world. You know, like I, I joke with Kamel that like, hey, I was in the Marvel Universe at first before you were. <laughs> um <laughs> I you love know, it. but you know, he's actually you know a movie star. Yeah. Uh, but um, I was I was on a TV show, but it was like it was this it was the funnest thing to come to work, and you know, I just I put on dead people's clothes and love go that. do the job. You know, <laughs> from the forties, and wear my pants around my around my belly button like men did in that era. Which I never realized. That's why grandpas wear their pants up so high. Oh, that's their tradition. Yeah. yeah. Yep. You learn something new every day. Well, on top of all of that, Matt, you also have six comedy albums. Do you see any more albums in your future? Right now, it's the weirdest thing. I'm with this, there, there's this, there's a couple lawsuits that are up in the air trying to get uh, comedians their publishing rights. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's getting sorted out. So for me to just go, here, let me just drop an album without any of that getting started out. I wouldn't make any money. Sure. So it's like as much as I want to. And like, honestly, any back before streaming hit and you didn't even have to, where people were like, my first two albums got bootlegged a lot. I was like, fine. As long as people are listening to them, I <laughs> right. don't care. Take them. Yes, totally. Well, that completely makes sense. I hope that we do get to have an album from you again someday and that you make all sorts of money off of it. That's the goal. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, of course. Sure. Now, besides the tour, Matt, do you have anything else coming up this year that you're really looking forward to? Off the top of my head, I'm going to be on At Midnight, the Monday after mm -hmm. I leave Portsmouth. I'm psyched for that. Uh, the new version with Taylor Tomlinson. Yes. And then just, you know, being on tour and, uh, you know, I've got a couple things coming down the pike that I, I'm not allowed to talk about. But, um, you know, I know that I shouldn't have said anything. What a, what a jerk. No. Um, but, um no. Like, sure I do. Can't talk about it. Yeah. Then why did you tell me? <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, it's mostly, it's mostly just kind of being on the road and having that work. Uh, life balance that uh, been been a, a, a juggle, but been very very fulfilling, very nice. And you know, I'm I'm turning fifty this year, so it's, oh my gosh, it's it's crazy. And I to me, I'm I don't even really feel I I barely feel forty two. I don't know what's going Aww. on, but it's it, you know, but it's it's one of those things where I just I I'd rather just be honest about it and laugh about it. And yes. I I oh, told myself a long time ago I'd never be. When women lie about their age, I fully understand yes. our society is bad in terms of anything with estrogen added or anything that, uh, uh, you know, any woman, you know, is, 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 has got the deck stacked against her. But one thing I really always hated was when they'd be like, you'd ask a guy, hey, how old are you? He'd be like, well, I don't like talking about that. Like, shut up. <laughs> shut up. Own it. I'm 49. Yes. I, just, I I feel like that old thing of like the 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 less you lie, the less you have to remember. You know, 100%. And so I'd rather just talk about my life and talk about the reality of my life, and you know, say, yeah, I'm a 49 year old man with a three year old kid. Yes. I'm dying. <laughs> like I'm getting the hell beat out of me. Oh but it's like, what a way to go. Honestly, I feel like the I feel like the 300 Spartans in the Battle of Thermopylae. You know, oh. it's like 
you're I'm going to lose. This kid is going to kill me, but the fight is the best. Exactly. You know? Like you said, what a way to go in an epic, epic way. Oh. <laughs> Matt, you're awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. And everyone, be sure to check out Matt Bronger at Cisco Brewers in Portsmouth. He's doing three shows, one on Friday, a couple on Saturday. And you can get those tickets as we speak at mattb.eventbrite.com. Matt, thank you so much again. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it.